Welcome back to What's New with Mead. This is episode 22. I'm here with TK in drinks, or uh, how do you want me to refer to you tonight? I don't really know. Uh, my name is TK. You just call me TK. Just TK? Okay, cool. I didn't know if you had any, any special way. But I'm here with uh, TK from TK and Drinks, and I, I'm excited to get to talk to him. He's a another Mead uh, YouTuber. He does a, a, a little bit of a different genre of Mead YouTubing in that he does mostly mead reviews from what I've seen, but yes, regardless, I'm excited to have you here, TK. Oh, well, thanks, Gary. I'm very uh, glad to be here and I'm um, looking forward to uh, having uh, conversations with you, man. I've, I've watched a lot of your stuff. I, I'm a fan of this series. And before we get too far, if memory serves, you're a teacher, right? Yep. Yep. I'd like to say uh, thank you very much for your uh, teaching and doing that whole stuff. I got a kid who's on an IEP and all that stuff, and uh, great teachers mean the world to me and my family. So thank you for doing that, brother. Well, I, well, I do what I can, you know. And I'm sure that I understand that's a hard situation. I IEPs yeah. and and those things can be tough, but I have no doubt that you have some great teachers in your uh, yes, you do. So child's life. Hey, so let's first talk about what everyone talks about every podcast. And that is what are we drinking? So I'm gonna start with you because we briefly talked about it. And I'm very curious about your third one, you said, but what, what all are you drinking tonight? Uh, so first up here, I got a IPA from a local brewery here in Tombstone, Arizona, called the Oregon uh, Triple Lots to Triple Hop IPA. Um, it's one of my favorites I've been drinking it's super juicy, super hazy. Man, super flavorful. Yeah, I was going to say, it looks real hazy, for sure. <laughs> but it looks good. Yeah, they've been in the hazy game since it started, so yeah, they're on point. What else you got? You got something delicious there. Oh, you had a couple more, or do you want to wait and introduce the other ones later? Um, the other one, my next one I have, I might not open this one yet. It's a oh, okay. uh, barrel-aged um, s'mores, uh, barrel-aged s'mores stout from another local uh, brewery here in uh, Arizona. 8-Bit Ale Works. Hey. Man, this is phenomenal. I had one on Halloween. I've mm -hmm. been saving that one. And then my other one, I have to run out and grab that one. Oh, one you're good. Second. You're totally good. If you're uh, um, new to this podcast, you can, and you're listening to it right now, you can actually go and see a video version um, on YouTube. So go check it out on there. Um, and there's a video so you can actually see what he's holding up as well. What yes. do you got? one i got is called the love apple this is a green tomato and lemon mead from the guys at unpossible there in uh, just outside chicago in dwight illinois and this is a uh, i bought it just out of morbid curiosity to be honest with you and it, it actually was really delicious i was uh, huh. really surprised yeah when you had said green tomato and mead i did not i i immediately thought of um uh what is that called the the bud uh, bud light clamato What's that called? Oh, like a Clamato or something yeah, like that. I had one of those one time and just about wanted to throw up. So I immediately had those like that flashback of drinking and trying that. Yeah, this one is, yeah, I, I, I hear you. I was very hesitant. I didn't go in with uh, high hopes, you know, low hopes. You can't uh, be let down too much, but it was actually really good. And I, I, I suggest anybody, if you're ever in that area, uh, stop through and try it or even grab a bottle because it's a, it's a darn good meat. For and sure. Certainly man. one to be able to, you know, for curiosity factor when people come over. Yeah. Well, and I want to get to that in a moment about all your things you've tried because of your, we'll talk about your channel, but I'll briefly talk about my stuff. I've got um, an experimentalish thing. I've got a, a orange cream mead and yeah. it's something that it turned out. Okay. Then I have a, I've been uh, working on, well, like a while back, I uh, bottle carbonated a blueberry mead. So I've got a blueberry mead, just a little sample here. And then Excellent. the main one I like, I call this because uh, my mom, now that my my brother has uh, a son, she's a grandma. So this is Mima's special stout. It's an oatmeal raisin cookie stout. So it's it's one of the more favored of um, these three. So nothing too crazy. I'm really, like I told you earlier, I've been trying to uh, clear out some of my mead room a little bit because I'm about to bottle a bunch of stuff back here, as you can see. Um, oh yeah, you've got a plethora of stuff. I'm so intrigued as to what it all is. I oh, love, I love when you're the, the candy cane unwrapping and, and all this stuff. It's just absolute madness, dude. I love it. 
It's fun. It's, uh, I realized um, as I was editing some stuff yet the other day, I have 20 projects happening right now, 20 different meads that I'm working on, which is fun, but then I'm constantly updating things. So it's pretty wild. So. Right on, man. Yeah, that's impressive. I have 20 projects going. I'm sure you're a, uh... Your journal is rather large, or do you do a digital version? Oh yeah, it's all digital for sure. I uh, I tried to do a paper one for a little bit, but then I think I lost the first iteration, and then I realized that it wouldn't work very well to keep doing that. So, gotcha. So I want to start off um, this episode by um, first of all plugging your own YouTube channel and kind of your social medias, and I want to let you talk about them because you can obviously talk about them better than me. Where where are you? Or where can people find you in the internet? So I'm on Facebook is my biggest presence right now on Facebook slash TK and Drinks. Um, I have an Instagram of the same name TK and Drinks, and then my YouTube channel, which I don't have enough uh, subscribers yet for that to let me customize my um, channel name but if you just search tk and drinks on youtube uh, i pop up purple and pink logo tk and drinks um and i've got 40 plus mead reviews on there some just get to know me type videos a little couple little informative videos and uh basically what i'm trying to do is just bring awareness to the mead community and uh try to you know there's there's a stigmata out there that mead um at least commercially anyways, I, I'm, I'm still really new to the homebrew world. Uh, but in the commercial world, I'm finding that there's a stigmata that mead is always going to be this expensive hoity toity type of thing. And I, I really want to kind of squash that and, and let everybody know that, you know, you can get mead from all different calibers, you know, mead has been around for eight plus thousand years and all different cultures. And it's, it, it, it needs to be explored by everybody. I don't want people to shy away from it just because of something they heard or something they read or something like that. I, I'm trying to bring a full experience to everybody uh, in the best way I know possible, which is to expose people to as many different varieties. Yeah. Um, I don't make any myself, but uh, I do have a lot of stuff that I've been buying and trying. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, that, and that kind of leads me to my, my um, kind of first topics. So, where, uh, as someone who buys commercial meads and is seeking mm-hmm. them out, um, where do you find is the e- or where do you purchase most of your meads? Do you go through Vino Shipper? Do you just travel a lot and pick up things? Or, um, um, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I tend to cut people off. I apologize. Oh, you're good. No, 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 you're good. I was going to say, just ask you. You know, um, it's kind of hard, at least here in Oklahoma, to get them. I don't know if you're up in a region where the meat is more prevalent, but I have to order everything in. So. Where do you right. get your meads? Um, so I do order everything online through Vino Shipper as they are the, um, basically the way everything is set up logistically and legally. Uh, they have kind of a stranglehold on that, which is um, kind of going into another feature of my, my, my aspects of my business. But um, so I just go to, basically I just started um, searching out different meaderies on, on Google and browsing their uh, Facebook pages and web pages and found ones that looked intriguing and sounded intriguing based off what they said and uh, and just kind of picked them that way at random and uh, how I even got into it is I have a buddy who brews uh, or makes meat up in Washington state's named John Opegard from Opegard Meadery um, and he kind of got into this back uh, I got uh, started back at the beginning of summertime and he was a big influence in that and I kind of just been going, but yeah, I just pick them at random and just, uh, you know, pull that trigger that, uh, I saw a video you were doing with, uh, doing the most mm-hmm. your last one. And you guys were talking about how it's, uh, something about, you know, it's hard to justify spending X amount of dollars on a bottle, you know, it's a three, seven, five bottle and you got to pay shipping and all this and everything. And that's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to do this because I wanted to show um, expose people to those things so they can kind of get a feel and a vibe of, you know, these other meteries that, you know, I don't want everything to constantly go to, uh, you know, superstition and Gronfell and Meridian Hive, you know, because they have super huge market penetration mm-hmm. and not to say that their stuff isn't good, but I want to let everybody know it's kind of like the whole small business Saturday thing, you know, let everybody know that, You know, people like you who potentially could want to go to a commercial stage are going to need support just as much as the big guys out there. 
for sure for sure no i love that honestly um i i find it fascinating every time you post a video it's it's interesting to me because you always have a very um like you just said not a big ticket mead uh or some of them are but a lot of the yeah. time you're, you're finding the stuff that is, is smaller groups or um, upcoming meteries. And I, I think that's fantastic. I, I, of course, as we are in the process of making mead, we should be buying mead to uh, taste what it, ours should somewhat taste like, I should, I feel like. Um, but it's just to compare yourself against your peers, you know, see what everybody's doing, who's got new tricks and uh, different techniques and stuff, I guess. Yeah. And I, it's, it's all research. I mean, it's what it is. It's, and it, it's research and you're getting to enjoy a good beverage, um, hopefully a good beverage. So, <laughs> so that kind of leads me to my next question. With your 40 plus mead reviews and however many other meads you have tried at this point, do you have any favorite um, company or meadery or, you know, uh, yeah, I guess um, meadery? Yeah, actually. So I, well, I do enjoy my buddy John's meadery up there in Washington. I'd have to say, honestly, my favorite meadery that I've tried is a place out of uh, outside Houston, Texas, called Black's Ferry Meadery. Um, everything that they had comes in a 375, or it's a 500 bottle, I believe, or 375 smaller bottles, but they're very reasonably priced, and everything is on point. They have a, my favorite mead by far is a black currant cacao mead that they made. Mm. I mean, they hit every note on point. This stuff was just phenomenal I, I i couldn't wax on prolific about it enough so how did you find out about them uh honestly it was just a straight google search i was went on to google one day and started um when i started this whole tk and drinks thing and started adding meteries just going searching on the map scrolling and zooming into different uh, regions and searching meteries and see who was uh, still active because there's a ton of meteries that have pages and facebook groups that are no longer active closed mm -hmm. down or whatever so I eventually just kind of picked, went region by region. I think my, my map up to right now is like out 190 brewery, uh, meteries and breweries on there that I'm looking to try. And, uh, but yeah, so I just, they were really close to me here in Phoenix and it was hot in the summertime when I ordered. So I wanted something close that I knew was going to be a uh, short shipping distance was kind of how mm -hmm. I, that one got chose. And it ended up being luck of the draw that they were phenomenal. I, I fell in love with everything that they did. Yeah. Oh, and that's, that's a big call out for people. If you're interested in trying mead, do exactly what, what TK has done and just start, you know, Google searching and you'll find uh, like around me, uh, Oklahoma is a very dry mead state. Um, yeah, and that we only have, there and that's about it. Yeah. We don't have it. We don't have much. And so um, you, I, I kind of have to go other places to, to find stuff, but you might live in a area of the world or area of the U S or wherever you're at, um, that has local meads or, um, even meads that are semi local to you and it's good to support those people. So my, Very my, you have a favorite. Now I yep. have to ask the opposite. Is there one that you've tried and this is not to bash any company, any meadery, but is there one that you, you were like, Oh yeah, I've heard this is awesome. And you were, and you were disappointed by Denver. Absolutely. I, I'd say that's actually coming to be a happen more often than I'd want it to, unfortunately. Um, uh, there was a chocolate orange one I had that was just, I, I don't know if it was like if they used orange extract or orange concentrate, I think is what I read online. But just the flavor profile was not there. It had tasted like a not like pulpy orange juice, but like when you leave like the white part of the orange on there, the pith or whatever, it gives that very bittery type of, and then there, there was like hardly any chocolate profile, maybe like a, like a baker's chocolate, again, like mm. not sweet leaning. And it was supposed to be a semi-sweet to sweeter leaning meat, and it just did not hit the flavor profile. And then uh, my, flavor, my favorite meads are blueberries, so I'm always trying to find a good mm -hmm. blueberry mead. And I had one that was, again, just... Um, from what I understand, it was made a blueberry mead with orange blossom honey. Mm -hmm. And I understand that that's incredibly hard to pull off. Orange blossom honey and blueberry don't necessarily go together unless mm -hmm. you kind of make it work. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm, not a, I'm not a mead maker. I haven't made any before or anything like that. So I, I'm still learning the process and everything like that. I, I got some friends here in the area that make, and I, I get to watch occasionally, but uh, it's all still new to me. But yeah, I, 
that those two, spe <coughs> excuse me, specifically were just as close to a drain pour as you could get. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with, obviously I've seen some pretty wild stuff on your channel of, of, uh, you know, the green tomato, uh, yeah. one is a perfect example. Has there been a flavor combination, um, from a company like that orange and, and chocolate that mm -hmm. has not worked very well in your opinion or. Absolutely. Oh yeah. The very first one I did was a taco meat flavored meat from, <laughs> that one. Yeah. from Open Guard Meadery up there in Washington. And yeah, that was just, it, it, from what I understand, it's incredibly divisive. People either love it or hate it. I, all I could taste was like a metallic -y type taste and just super heavy on the red pepper flakes. And a lot of other people can pick up all the individual notes from the cumin and the garlic and everything. And for me, it was just washed out. But, Did they explain a process on that one at all to you? Like, um, I, I never asked them about the process and how he makes it or anything. Um, again, not being a maker, it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to me or anything. Uh -huh. But uh, but yeah, it, it just, it, it was not for me. I couldn't, uh, I kept the bottle around to show some people and I take it, I took it to a couple, a uh, couple shares and stuff like that. And, and it was, uh, again, pretty divisive. You had either people like it or hate it. There's nobody in the middle kind of like, yeah, that's okay. It's, it's whatever. It's either yes or no. And did it, so with it being taco, did it taste like beef? Like <laughs> that just, no, it, was, it was more just like, um, all okay. those taco spices, cumin and oh, garlic okay. and red pepper. And, um, mm. it, it was all that mixed with the honey and it was a semi-sweet meat. So it was definitely had a heavier, um, mouth feel to it and, and stuff. So it, 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 it hung That's around for a little while, but it was, it, again, it was just not for me. Yeah. Um, I, I told him he shouldn't make it anymore because it's so <laughs> terrible, but he, uh, Apparently he said somebody people, likes it. Break, break down. Uh, he sells out of it every time he makes it. He, he hates it himself. He says, I can't even stand this stuff. But I, I, to me, that's like the ultimate pinnacle of customer service. You, you make something that you don't like because you have enough people in your customer base that do. Come on. That's, that's pretty wild. I, uh, I don't even know. I, that just sounds gross. A taco me does not work. <laughs> in my head I, at all yeah i i'm right there with you brother well so you you said you don't really make any mead have you homebrewed much at all in your experience or are you uh i have not homebrewed at all i'm basically just a guy who's always enjoyed a craft well enjoyed craft beer and craft mead for uh not mead for as while but i've been a craft beer drinker for a long long time and uh, me over the past, I'd say two years or so, been really getting more and more into that. So and what led just, you to me then? Um, my buddy John up there um, making me. Uh, I kind of we had lost contacts. Him and I've been friends for since uh, right out of high school and that kind of era. And uh, we lost touch, and I got back in touch with him, and he found out that he'd been brewing me up in Washington and started buying just to support his business, not knowing whether I was going to like it or not. And, uh, you know, his meat and it just kind of took off from there and I love it. And then I ended up losing my job, uh, or got laid off back at the beginning of the whole COVID stuff. And he really encouraged me to, um, I have a background in video production. So he said, why don't you do something with video production and, and meat? And I looked out there and I seen you and, um, like city steaders and a couple other people, but nobody um, on the, you know, you guys are, are massive out there, but nobody on the lower end. So I was like, you know, I can, I can do this. So I went out and took my BJCP uh, certification test mm. passed the written one. I have a supposed to be having a practical here in um, January, as long as that doesn't get canceled, you know, come with everything that's going on. And that's kind of just what's uh, led me to where I'm at now. That's awesome. Okay. I, I want to dive into that. Because I've, I've heard you are uh, either you are BJCP certified or you're working that way. But what does that process look like as somebody who's been through it so far? Oh, so um, it sounds a lot more daunting than it is. Um, so they have a, a written test that you have to take that's 200 questions. It's timed. I can't remember how long it was. I want to say like 90 minutes or 60 minutes or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous it breaks down to like 16 or 17 seconds per question. And I mean, these are some serious questions, you know, what's the flavor pro profile of, uh, 
fast with honey? What's, um, you know, what are the um, ar aromic profiles of, uh, of a, 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 a buckwheat honey? And, and it just breaks all these things down. And it's pretty intense. You know, I don't, they, they really don't want you to get into it too much to save the integrity of the test. They actually specifically ask you that. Yep. But it, there's 200 questions. They have a study guide that you can download that's, 84 pages for just the study guide. Then they have the ingredients profile one with like another 40 pages for the, yeah. um, and it goes over like the color of all the honeys and all these different things. It, it was, it was a process. And then um, you have to pay to take the test. It's kind of insignificant, um, less than $50 to take the test. And once you take that test, then it's, um, you have to wait four months and then you can get scheduled to do a practical exam at one of their, um, if, uh, testing events, which they only have for the Mead one because it's such a small focus of their organization. They only have one every couple months, and they're usually nowhere near where you're at. Like I have to travel. I'm, I live in Phoenix. I have to travel to Houston. The next closest one to me that I saw in my time frame was Santiago, Chile. So oh my gosh. <laughs> that's yeah, insane. And the matter of traveling to Israel, and I don't really have that capability. Mm -hmm. So I kind of actually even got lucky that there's one in Houston. Um, but yeah, so that's as far as what the, that's going to entail. I don't know. I think it's just sitting in a room and they put a flight in front of you of about five meads and you have to go through, break down what you think the honey is, you know, whether you think it's a still, uh, sparkling or wherever, you know, the strength, uh, uh -huh. you got to, uh, you know, residual sugar, everything like that, as much information as you can give them. And from what I understand, it's a fairly subjective thing you know there's not a lot of objective evidence not like i have a, a hygrometer there to check the gravity and all these things right. but you get enough of the points right you either pass or fail there's no in between man so how are you obviously you're tasting meads but when it mm -hmm. gets into the specifics of like you're trying to identify buckwheat honey are you actually going out and and purchasing honey and then tasting it to get those profiles or are you going simply by your like study guide knowledge for these things a heavy let's go with um 65 to 70 percent study guide 30 percent 35 percent practical i don't have access to a lot of those i i really try to stay away from grocery store honey because you can never really trust the integrity of it even mm -hmm. if it was, says what it is you can't be sure if it was boiled or not or whatever so i, I just try to stay away from that and I can only get so much here at my local farmer's markets and um, the apiaries around here only produce so many different, you know, cause they're, we don't really grow a lot of buckwheat here in Arizona. Right. Um, so unfortunately for that, I am um, it, relying a lot on the, um, uh, the guide, but I'm trying to buy as many traditionals as I can that are single variety. Like I had a single variety from space time meat and cider works in Pennsylvania. That was a, um, uh, palmetto honey and man that has got to be in my top three favorites that was so <laughs> so delicious so smoky and and earthy it was just delicious i haven't heard about that kind of honey i, I need to there's so many that's that's one thing i realized when i when i got into mead making was like i knew of walmart honey you know and you, you're like oh it's clover honey and so that's about it or wildflower and then or baker's honey whatever but then the spectrum just blows up and you have so many varietals. It's, it's absurd. Um, I, I, that's really interesting. You know, you're talking about the, the tasting side of it. I have a friend who is um, doing something similar. Um, he's doing the wine version basically of BJCP mm -hmm. and uh, going through all of the sommelier. Was it? Sommelier. Sommelier. <laughs> what a word. Um, uh, stuff. And he's explained that the same processes and that like, he oh, has sure. to know specific, um, for their test, you have to know specific like regions that the wine was made in and right. all these crazy things. So that's pretty fascinating. Um, I'm sure you're having to do a lot of uh, studying even still after your paper yeah. test. Oh yeah, basically make flashcards of all the honey varieties. It, I feel honestly, and, you know, I don't know how anybody else in the BJCP feels. I haven't got to talk to a whole lot of people. I follow some of their Facebook groups, but it's kind of a, you know, it's more of a once you're in, you're in type of thing. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I haven't got to experience a whole lot of the, the variety and got to talk to um, everybody about what they're feeling. But I feel like it's 
I don't want to say a, a, a scam, but I feel like I'm cheating almost because I'm just memorizing all these facts. And I feel like, you know, it's almost like I'm cheating. I know what to look for in a buckwheat honey now. So am I telling myself that I'm tasting or am I really tasting, it, mm. you know? And it's me. I'm just kind of a nerd like that. I get a little psychosomatic in my head, but, um, you know, it, it is, it's a lot of cramming. It's a lot of just studying for that because again, it's not a whole monetary thing. It's not like I'm going to be out a lot of money if I don't pass this test. It's more of a, you know, I put all this time and energy into it and I, I just really want to, uh, you know, really want to show that I, that I'm proved to myself that I'm trying to, uh, you know, that it's worth what I'm doing. For sure. For sure. Well, I think that's, um, honestly, that's something I would love to do one day. The BJCP is, um, it's kind of an honorary badge. I feel like there are, sure. like you said, it's not a big test, but well, it is a big test, but it's not a highly attended test by people, meaning that there aren't just thousands of BJCP certified judges like floating around. Well, there's, according to their website, they have, and I'm not quite sure because it's a little bit vague on how they word it, but roughly... 9,000 between 8,500 and 9,000 members. Now, I don't know if that's active mm. or overall. Yeah, that's that's taking the test. Um, that seems like as so, many have taken the test. Sorry. Right. So even if you, let's, you know, be on the incredibly liberal side and say, yes, that's how many active members they, they have. 8,000, you know, 9,000 members worldwide. That's not a whole lot of people. Mm -mm. No, especially, yeah, considering the world, if, if that were the U.S., it'd be one thing, but that's that's sure. the entire world. Right, and of those people, only a small percentage of them even have the mead pens. And, and you know, the B, the BJCP and, the, and all these other organizations aren't the be-all, end-all to mead. You know, it's just one group's opinion. It's because you have a, a hazy mead that's going to cause you to score low in their competition because that's a low grading quality. It doesn't mean that it's a bad mead, you know. And that's one of the things I try to stress on my channel as well is, this is just one group of people's, um, you know, factors for judging me. That doesn't mean that it, everything that doesn't fall into this bracket is bad. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you need to explore and try things on your own and, and, and realize that maybe sometimes that you don't like what this particular judge likes, you know, it's like a, almost like a movie critic or a book critic or something like that. You know, you find somebody that you jive with and kind of use that as a starting point and, and build your own path from there. So have you ever sat down with one of those BJCP uh, score sheets and like attempted to do a mead review with that before, or are you just kind of going by verbal notes um, for I, most of your tests? I use the BJCP, the BJCP sheets on all my mead reviews. I, there was a handful that I, uh, like two or three that I didn't because I either didn't have one printed out or it was some other circumstance, but I try to use that score sheet um, again for practice on myself. Um, on all my different episodes and, and I try to be as um, transparent as possible and, and show my scores of what they are to my audience and just to let them know, Hey, um, you know, this is what it is. And I've actually had uh, meteries that I've reviewed reach out to me and said that they actually appreciate getting that type of feedback and have asked for copies of those score sheets just for their own knowledge. Yeah. Which I thought was kind of a, uh, uh, it actually took me aback, to be honest with you, I, I, that they're even watching the videos, but I, I thought that was pretty cool. That is cool. One thing I do with mine, um, of course, being a teacher, I'm like this analytical uh, right. worksheet kind of mind. I, I do like a um, uh, custom mead review score. Yeah, it's out of 70. Um, but I, I do that mainly, like, I think it's good for people to see even if it's just my opinion and it's not the end all be all, like you said earlier, it's, it's just an opinion by one person right. where we rank things. And so I, I put mine up, up actually on a um, Google sheet as well that people can access to see, Oh, he put this as his first and yada, yada, yada. Right. But uh, those, those are just, well, meat reviews themselves are really important for us as the consumer, but also as other people are saying, I think your mission for educating the YouTube and Facebook realm on the mead options in the world is super awesome. And I, and I really appreciate that. Oh, well, thank you, man. That means a lot to me coming from uh, people that are in the, in the YouTube world and especially in the mead world. Um, it, it's a, I know it's, it seems like a, 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 a large community cause you know, there's all these meaderies and this homebrew organization, but, it's really a, 
it's really not. It's really a pretty small community once you, mm-hmm. you know, really get into it. And I think it's it really, like you were saying, it's important to get as much um, positive uh, critiques out there as possible to help just bring the industry up as a whole. You know, high tide rises all boats. Yeah. So, um, and, and that's another thing I try to do. I have a, again, I went to a art school and I, I really want to try to, when I be critiquing, be as helpful as possible. Constructive criticism. You know, I'm not trying to just slam somebody's stuff because I don't like it. Let them know why I don't like it, what could potentially be better. And those are the things I'm still learning is, you know, what advice I could give to say, make it better. But at least if I can give as much positive, constructive feedback as possible, what I did and didn't like about it, and and to let other people know, hey, to look out for this or that, or, you know, just, again, to help other people know to be constructive with their criticism and and pass on uh, more positive vibes in the community. Yeah. Dude, I, I love that. I think that's, that's awesome. I, um, that's kind of one of my overarching missions is, to, is just to tell people about mead and, and get the word out and yeah. help it help the community grow. Um, and I, I think you're doing awesome, awesome stuff. So my next question, um, sorry, I, I have I wrote down some notes because, you know, when you start drinking mead, you get, you can be a little lost. Yes. <laughs> so are you, um, what what's your ultimate goal post BJCP certification? Are you wanting to start judging more? Are you eventually thinking of ever starting a meadery? Like what what would you what's your dream? Well, um, actually, that kind of goes into what I'm doing right now. Um, so when I first started it, it was to try to do almost something like um, what I initially had thought you were doing which was um, just a lot of mead related videos. But then I realized that you're doing a lot of videos of your own stuff. So I can't really compare what I'm doing to what you're doing. It's kind of two different, two different worlds. Um, but what I ended up doing is I'm going to be wholesaling mead here in Arizona. Mm. I've uh, picked up my wholesalers, uh, alcohol distributors license just came in yesterday as a matter of fact. Mm. And Congratulations. Be, That's awesome. Oh, thanks. And I'm going to be purchasing from some of these meaderies that I've reviewed and trying to just bring um, more quality mead to the shelves in Arizona. You know, we have, thankfully, we've got five meaderies here in Arizona, which is, I mean, absolutely astonishing compared to some states that don't have, you know, several states that don't have any at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, commercial meaderies. Um, So I'm trying to just bring some more mead to the shelves. Arizona's got, Phoenix has one of the fastest growing, um, fastest growing areas in the country right now. And I'm just trying to, uh, you know, ex- take my show into the physical world and expose as many people as I can to quality mead to try to help uh, grow the industry that way as well. Yeah, man. And so does the BJCP step help you? Um, do you feel like it's just expanding your knowledge on mead or do you plan on actually taking and, and trying to be a judge in some situations with this? Since I guess you'll technically be able to do that post certification. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. I could definitely go to like a Mazer cup and, and all these different organi- um different things when they're going again. Uh, I, I was leaning going that route and just leaning towards um, back this up. The BJCP thing was to kind of lead, uh, lead a little bit of um, credibility to me, since how I'm not a maker. I want to at least uh, show people, even if I don't get past the test or whatever happens, at least that I'm trying and that I have some sort of, relative knowledge in the field. Uh, my plan was to be able to uh, be able, my plan was to be able to be a judge and to travel and go to all these other things. But with the whole coronavirus and whatever's going on right now, uh, I couldn't rely on that as my only source of income and my only source of um, adding content to the show because I didn't know how often I'm going to be able to get to go to these things. And with their online, they have all these restrictions on what you can record and all this stuff. So, it kind of just ended up shifting this other way. And um, so I'm going to do the wholesale thing. And then after mm-hmm. everything gets uh, cleared up, I definitely want to keep the BJCP thing going and try to attend as many uh, judging events as possible. And just, like I said, use it as credence to uh, kind of, for lack of a better term, justify, give um, a little bit of credibility to my uh, reviews. Yeah. Do you have to re-up your BJCP every couple of years? How does that work? 
from what I understand and have read online, yes, you have to attend X amount of events. Um, these events are worth uh, points. There's like a whole mm. point structure system in, in there. And you have to attend so many events to make sure you don't uh, basically fall fall behind and fall out. And as long as you keep up on it, uh, I haven't read that there's a an annual fee. If there is, I'm sure it's really insignificant, you know, $20, $30, something like that. Mm -hmm. But as best I understand, as long as you keep going and keep uh, keep going uh, to events and everything, you, you, you're pretty much good to go. Okay, yeah. Uh, that definitely makes me think that the whole 8,000, 9,000 thing is definitely not true because I, I highly doubt there are 8,000 people actively – you know, getting all their points, so to speak. Right. Yeah. Going year. attending four or five judging competitions a year across the country. Cause it's not just, you know, local ones. They have to have, you know, be a part of either the BJCP and they were um, also part with the uh, HB with the homebrew association. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're not aligned with one of those for their specific event, then yeah, you're not going to be getting points for it. I'm not sure. Again, like I said, I haven't, um, it's kind of like a brotherhood. Once you're in, you get a lot more knowledge and everything. But from what I can pick up online, if you're not attending their events, they don't really count towards their points. Yeah, that's a, that does seem like a complex thing. But obviously, it is. Uh, I see the value of it to make sure you're actually being an active member. Because this is like, uh, I'm sure you've developed the same thing or maybe you think the same thing. Like developing your palate is not a... A one-time thing. You don't you don't taste no. a, a blueberry mead and then from then on go like perfectly describe a blueberry. Like you you have to taste it many many times throughout your career to really understand it. Absolutely, and there's a difference between uh, a blueberry that's been fermented and blueberry juice that's been fermented. Mm -hmm. and, and picking up all those subtle nuances is, is the things that are difficult for me. You know, you as somebody who's doing it and brewing with all these different, um, you know, you can choose whether you want to use uh, fresh blueberries or concentrate or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you can have that, um, you know, you can taste it in the process and say, okay, I can taste this difference from when I use fresh in this batch versus when I use concentrate in this batch. I'm still having to try to discern the, all those subtle nuances. And that's a real, um, I have to say, that's probably one of my biggest difficulties right now is trying to figure that out. I try to be as um, scientific. Now, luckily, I have a produce background. I worked in produce for many years. So I, I have a, um, a larger exposure to different types of fruit and varieties of things like that uh, mm -hmm. than most people. But even that is, is still paling in comparison to the to the different flavor profiles that are being produced by all these fermentations. It's, it's absolutely insane. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I've, um, I've done so many AB tests of things and that anytime you introduce an ingredient, you are creating another um, tree of possibilities, so to speak mm -hmm. for what's going to happen. So uh, does that make you want to start homebrewing some like, so you can get better at that? Or do you have any plans to ever, at least for research to, purposes, do it? Oh, I would, I would love to start doing that. Right now, um, my biggest thing is space. I don't have, I don't have a whole ton of uh, room to do that. And living here in Phoenix, you really need to have a serious grip on your temperature control. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it gets, uh, I mean, this summer we had 35 plus days of 115 plus weather. Man. And without something like that, I, I would just, I wouldn't be doing the meat justice. You know what I mean? It would be blowing up and, and, and not turn into what I needed. But ultimately, come the future, yeah, I would love to be able to uh, to brew my own stuff. Now, unfortunately, I would have to let my wholesaler license lapse in Arizona. Oh. If I ever wanted to open a meter, you can't, those conflict. You can't be a wholesaler and a producer. Mm. But um, I would just like to do it for more of a, more of to just build my knowledge on the uh for the bjcp type stuff just to know what's what's what you know i, I see you have a ton of uh the carboys back, back there behind you i'd love to have something like that in a in a shed of just you know magic potions brewing up back there to taste everything that's uh that i could that i could think up yeah if anything you're saving money i mean you could if you get good at it you can find a recipe and, oh, and brew for 12 bucks i don't know about saving. Oh, oh, oh i'm sorry yeah you mean saving money if you're brewing yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're brewing it, you could be saving a lot of money. Yes. 
Oh my gosh, people don't even want to know how much money I've spent on all these. <laughs> yeah, I'll also let yeah, you in private about that. I won't make you say it on here, but uh, <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I I definitely find a lot of value in doing this myself, and and especially yeah. uh, um, I enjoy where I'm at a lot because I get to do I get to actually make it in the new videos and I'll do all that stuff. Yeah. But then the other side of like trying meads is also super enjoyable for me because I feel yeah. like I'm getting research on all sides. I'm doing scientific tests. I'm making recipes. I'm trying commercial meads. Um, and you know, if I ever were to pursue a BJCP, I think that that stuff would just accrue to help me hopefully get that certification if I were to go for it. But, um, I, you know, I, I found it really interesting and I wanted to ask you that for sure. Like if you'd homebrewed, because you try yeah. so, so many meats at this point that in my brain, I was like, surely he also homebrews on the side. <laughs> he just doesn't talk about it. Right. So. See, yeah. And that's what I was kind of curious. Um, if you knew whether I brewed or not, cause I, every, everything that your show is about everything that are home brewers and I'm, I'm the opposite of that. I'm not a home brewer, but, uh, I, again, I'm glad you, you you had me out and reached out to me, man. I, I appreciate it. Hey, well, I, I mean, it doesn't matter if you if you homebrew or not. You still have valuable knowledge and, and your um, experience alone and just, um, well, first of all, I'll say this. Whenever I, I found out about you and I saw some of your meat reviews, I also ended up finding your Facebook page and saw kind of what your conquest was of, of yeah. wanting to be a wholesaler and, and doing the BJCP thing. And that, that is its own really important sphere of mead making. Like without BJ, BJCP certified judges, we're not going to have people to judge our meads when we take them to competitions. And without right. people who are pushing the product like you, well, um, we're not going to have mead in the shelves. I can say that like firsthand experience because my – we talked about it a little bit ago, but Oklahoma sucks for mead production. We've got one meadery and they like are real iffy. They, they don't even have anything in stores. So, um, the B and G meadery. Mm -hmm. I actually have never tried their stuff. Um, I should. Oh, really? Yeah. That's one I've tried everywhere. A lot of other places, but I haven't tried them yet. Um, so well, it's hard to tell them if they're not in a store. That means you got to go all the way down to wherever they're at to get and it. And if it's I do not think they should, them, they might ship. I don't know. I, I could probably get a hold of some, but, um, so the, the problem here in Oklahoma city, at least is that yeah. there's only one store that has mead and the mead they have is, is Redstone and Chaucer's. Chaucer's. They don't even carry Dinsk. They had, uh, they have some moonlight, but that's, those are the only three. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So is it like a, like a, is it like a commercial, uh, alcohol store like a bevmo or a total wine no oh, this wow. is a, it's a really unique store because it's it's called freeman's liquor mart it's in oklahoma city and they, they do a lot of um individual they buying things individually from companies so Ooh. they end up finding some pretty unique uh, beverages and you can kind of wow. they're the type of store you can go in and say hey i heard about this beer in idaho can you get me a bottle of it and then they right. they'll reach out and get it so it's a pretty cool thing in my opinion yeah see and that's what i want to do i want to be that guy for mead here in arizona i want to be able to i mean because we have here um we have obviously superstition is from is from arizona and they've dominate everything and i'm not the biggest fan of their stuff and we've got a couple other um local meaderies but i want to i want to put i want to put smaller meteries to, to get exposure for everybody else. I mean, it, it shouldn't be the, just the, the Gehrgeists and the, the, you know, the, the big time, the big guys that have na nationwide penetration that, that get the whole, the, the shrams, you know, yeah. as, as awesome as shram stuff is, you know, they don't need to be the only one on the shelves in, in 37 States. You know what I mean? They should be able to be on, I, we recently got them here on, on our, on our shelves here in Arizona. I don't know about there in um, Oklahoma, but I do know they're on a huge push right now to be on as many shelves in as many States as possible. So I'm, I'm, have you tried trams before? I haven't. Um, they're on my shelf. Like I said, here at my local beer store, but I'm having a hard time justifying paying the price for what they are. Yeah. You know, you're, you're looking at, same same thing with superstition you know 
I, I like their stuff ish, mm -hmm. but not for what you have to pay for it for certain things. You know, mm -hmm. if the quality was consistent across the board, it would be a lot easier. But it, it for me, once you get to that size where you're producing that much all the time, your, your quality is going to not match up with the, uh, you know, with the smaller guys who can, who can buy the higher quality products. You know, when you're having to brew 200,000 liters or whatever, some mm -hmm. monstrous size portion, you can't get artisan stuff in that size of batches. Yeah, no, I, uh, I understand that. And they do amongst other people, they do some pretty niche meads. Like they have the, um, I tried their peanut butter jelly crime. Uh, I don't know if you tried that one. It's a that's peanut butter jelly. One of the biggest drivers. I'd say that's in their top five producers between that one and the blueberry space box. Yeah. And I haven't tried, I actually just ordered some superstition uh, mm -hmm. yesterday because they had um, free ground shipping. And so I was like, this is easy. Yeah. I can save 20 bucks. So, Absolutely. But they they have some um, very niche, interesting products. Yeah, they have. But, I would say they have the largest flavor catalog that I've seen from anybody. My local beer store here has, I want to say, no less than two dozen uh, different flavors for them. Mm -hmm. And some of them, and they they label all their bottles. You know, bottle number blank of how many. And they have some that are down into the low two hundreds for their batch size. Yeah. Have you yeah. tried um, Sap House Meadery before? See, I haven't. I, 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 to be honest with you, I've avoided a lot of the larger places because like we were saying earlier, you know, I'm trying to focus on some of the more small craft meaderies. Mm -hmm. um, I just did my last video, posted it up earlier, um, finishing off my first series of videos. And for my series two that's starting up next year, I'm going to go into a, a lot more of the larger stuff. I'm going to do the... Uh, do some Meridian Hive because I know they have a lot of penetration with their can market that they do. Um, those are great. Out, I love those. Uh, superstition and I try to do a couple more of the larger places uh, next time. Well, and the, the thing with Sap House, I, ha I still have a couple of bottles from them I need to do reviews for, but they have a really interesting um, barrel aged mead program. So they're, they have some specific meads that are aged in these various kinds of barrels. And it's really fascinating. They're kind of expensive. That's the only thing. Of course, they're a, a small batch product, um, but they have some, some cool stuff. And you're right. I do think these bigger meaderies can capitalize a little bit on their um, notoriety. Um, but it's, I think it's still enjoyable. Obviously, you, you spend a lot of time perusing the internet to find <laughs> mead. So uh, yeah. you undoubtedly have seen all of their catalog at this point. Well, well, most of my experience from their particular, if superstition specifically is, is in person from seeing it here, because um, they've got actually a brew house that they just opened in downtown Phoenix that's mm. like 10 miles from my house. Um, but it, it's more of... Um, like especially on social media, you, you search out there and they, the larger places come up a lot more just because they have so many more followers and they have so many more people sharing their stuff. And I think it's just the way that the algorithms are built on the, it's not the, it's not the fault of, I, I should, let me, let me say that. It's not the fault of superstition or Gehrgeist or, mm -hmm. or Grandfell or any of these other people. It's just the fact that the, the social media platforms, you know, the more popular they are, the more shares you get, you know? Right. So if I'm, I'm just trying to bring some more popularity to the smaller places to help them get some more, some more love. I'm, I'm not trying to take away anything from superstition or from these other guys, you know, they make a quality product. It's just not my, my personal favorite. And I would rather go and support small meteries than, than the larger ones. Now I happen to be lucky to where I don't have to order superstition. Anytime they come out with something new, it's, it's just right, right down the road, <laughs> which, you know, knock on wood. <laughs> And like I said, I feel very blessed. I have five meteries within driving distance of my house, five commercial meteries. And they're, and I got another one that's a smaller place that's that's coming up really quick here that I'm, I'm kind of excited about called the, uh, called the crack house. Mm. But, uh, but it, it's, you know, the, the big guys are big for a reason. You can't get that size without making quality product. And that's all there is to it. And making a lot of product. I think that's a lot of it. Yeah. I think it's quality and also just how big are your tanks, <laughs> you know? Well, oh. That's true too. You, you definitely got to have the big tanks and got to have some funding to be able to, you know, continue to produce something that size. But ultimately if you don't have uh, a quality product, you can, 
what's what's the term you know fake it till you make it mm -hmm. you can make it i think faking it to a certain size of a meadery out there if you didn't have a whole lot of uh clientele in the area that knew what mead was and whether you were producing a good quality product or not you could sell your product to a community but you couldn't get the size of you know superstition or mm -hmm. moonlight without actually making some quality products so you're going to have something that falls through the cracks here and there not always going to be everybody's favorite but ultimately you don't get that big without being good. i mean look at all wise they're coming up like man holy cow <laughs> well yeah when you're uh, um is that when you have that type of marketing though and it's dylan sprouts right or i can't remember yeah. which twin yeah whatever yeah, you, but... you're already kind of famous for tv shows i think he um which is a great thing he's blown up quite a bit um, but I think that he's, he had definitely has that aiding him in his conquest. Well, and that's what I mean though. Like he, something like that, he, whether I've never tried this stuff. Have you? I've had one. Um, what did I have? It was like a, a tea based. It might've been a oolong or something like that, but it was, it was very dry. Um, uh -huh. it was okay. It was my favorite, but it was okay. And somebody like that, he could use his general term. He could use his marketing platform to get so big, but ultimately he's not going to be able to grow to the size of these other places. If he doesn't actually make a quality product, yeah. your market is only going to get you so far. That's true. That's true. Yeah. I, um, well, I'm, I'm definitely really excited to see, um, you, you and your channel grow. I think one thing I do want to ask you before we have to close this down, thankfully the zoom hasn't uh, shut us out yet. So I don't know what's happening, but I'm a little worried about it blowing up at some point. Um, what, what's, what can we do as the Mead community, uh, do to help support you in your conquest? What are some things we can do to help you? Oh man. Um, like follow, share, subscribe, all the corny cheesy stuff that, you know, <laughs> as a YouTuber, you feel you, you you feel obligated to say that type of stuff, but every, you know, everybody already knows that that's the way that you're supposed to follow. But I mean, ultimately that's, that's the biggest thing. It gives me as much, uh, as much penetration as possible. Give me likes, follow shares. Um, and, and, um, actually, you know what, even bigger than all that, uh, feedback on any of my comments. Um, let me know if you've tried any of the meads based off of, um, off of my reviews or not, or even reach out to the meteries. That's one of the other things I'd like to stress in, in, in the closing minutes here is a lot of people have these questions I see on like um, the Mead uh, channels, uh, Reddit, Facebook, you know, Mead and everything like that. People have questions about um, commercial Meads and everything. Reach out to the meteries themselves. These people love to talk Mead, mm -hmm. especially with the people who are drinking their products. So I would say the biggest thing is just more communication. Let's, let's, uh, as much communication as possible is get those, those Facebook groups and the, the social media groups as big as possible Let's get as many people as we can that are outside the community to be exposed to the product. And, and I mean, just you having me on your show, I think is one of the biggest thing you have some 17 plus thousand, 18 plus thousand followers. And that's going to be just the biggest thing to me. So hey, thank you for having me on here. Hey, well, I'm, this is, this is as much fun for me as, uh, I'm sure you might just be you being on here is a, a blessing to me. So I'm thankful for that. And I feel like I love it. Well, I, I, um, I do want to ask one more thing. And that is yeah. alongside, you know, us supporting you and, and providing, you know, likes and shares and all that stuff. What are some yeah. things that we can expect um, that you'd be willing to talk about from your channel or, or what are some projects you're working on that we can be excited for? So um, my biggest thing right now, like I said, I'm, I'm getting everything lined up for uh, series two coming up next year. So I'm going to try to focus more on some of the larger um, meteries that do have stuff on shelves in multiple states, not just locally there in their um, home state. Um, I want to do some side-by-side -side comparison um, flavor profiles. This guy's blueberry versus that guy's blueberry, something like that. And one of the things I really would love to do is um, try some homebrew stuff from some homebrewers. I've had a couple people reach out to me and said that they would like to send me their stuff, um, which I'm totally on board with. I'm never, I'm never going to press anybody. You know, if somebody mm -hmm. reaches out to me and says, Hey, I'd love to get your input on this. You know, if we can make it happen, I would love to, if not, Hey, you know, it is what it is, but man, I would love to try some homebrew stuff from around the country because with this whole, situation with not being able to travel pretty much and there's no competitions going on. I'm not really being exposed to a lot of that. 
Right. So um, homebrewers here in Arizona or even California or, or New Mexico, somewhere within driving distance, I would love to be able to meet up with you and swap some bottles. I even have some commercial stuff. I'd be willing to, you know, maybe we can make something happen. Hey, that's gonna, there's a deal, <laughs> man. Hey, well, that, this has been so much fun and I appreciate you taking your time. I know you have a family and you have um, other major priorities in your life. So I appreciate you taking your time away from them. Um, well, no problem, my man. I scheduled this time for you and it was, <laughs> it was, a, it was awesome being here, man. I, again, thank you so much for reaching out to me. Absolutely. If you want to support TK and his um, YouTube career, Facebook career and all those things, go check out TK and drinks on uh, Facebook and both and youtube he does a lot of meat reviews if as we've been talking about tonight and um obviously he's got some big plans and um as mead making community members we should be supporting people who are also in this uh realm with us so go shower shower him with all those likes and, and comments and and uh subscriptions and all those things and um hopefully you know I, i'm excited to see the things that you're coming up with in the future Oh, well, thank you very much, man. I, I love watching your channel and seeing all the great things that you do and all your, your cool, crazy combinations that you do. I, I, I love it, man. It, it's, it's phenomenal. And you're an inspiration to me, man. And uh, I, I, it, it helps me drive when I see you doing what you're doing and the success that you have. It lets me know that people care about me and that this isn't a uh, faltering adventure. Well, I appreciate that. I, I'll, I'll keep going and I know you will too. It's going to be, we're going to make a, an impact in one way or another. So thank you so much for spending your time here, man. Um, I, I hope you have a wonderful night and, uh, I'll, and I, I know you didn't get to drink your other, uh, brews, but hopefully you'll get to sip on some of those tonight. Yes, I most definitely. All right, man. Well, appreciate it. Thank you very much, brother. Have a good evening.